It's October 3rd, 2003, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. So it was today in history in 2003 that the Roy half of Siegfried and Roy suffered the same unpredictable and yet a relatively wholly predictable fate as so many other performers whose acts involve handling dangerous animals. Well, today it was the turn of big cat trainer Roy, who, having never had a serious mishap in his 30,000 show career, suddenly, nearly fatally, did. Yeah, the mauling occurred during a show at the Mirage in Las Vegas. It was actually Roy's 59th birthday. Um, Manticore, who is a seven-year-old white tiger, apparently bit his sleeve during the show. There was a bit of argy-bargy. It's difficult to know, obviously, what a tiger's thinking, but it seemed like the tiger wasn't really following the routine, and Siegfried Roy did the same routine every night, so this was unusual. And when Roy swatted at him with a microphone, the tiger then suddenly seized him by the neck and dragged him off stage. The crew battled to separate them, I imagine battled pretty gingerly, as I would if I was in the situation, until finally one of them sprayed the tiger with a fire extinguisher, which caused him to release Roy and flee back to his cage. Yeah, that's the tip that you want to take with you. If you do ever have a 380-pound white tiger chasing you, a uh, fire extinguisher, who knew? Apparently tigers are scared of fire extinguishers. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as you alluded to in your intro, this is kind of shocking but not surprising, isn't it? Mm. You know, if you work with wild animals and even a white tiger that had been hand-reared by Roy for years, as this one had, and saw Roy as his father figure. I mean, we'll get into, like, the corporate spin that Siegfried and Roy and their people put on this later, I'm sure. But nonetheless, even if you accept their narrative that the tiger loved being part of a magic show and living in a tiny swimming pool in, in the Vegas heat, even if you accept that version and the tiger loved Roy, it's still a tiger (laughs) at some point it might just i mean my cat which i feed every day and loves me and purrs and sits on my chest and rubs my face does occasionally turn around for no reason at all and scratch me mine bites me all the time right and if it's a white tiger then once in 20 years when that happens unfortunately you are going to have a lot of your neck and shoulder ripped out. Well, and bear in mind that this all took place with zero physical boundaries between the stage and the audience, which contained 1,500 people. Although this was reportedly the first incident in over 30,000 shows. So it was unusual. And actually, the owner of the Mirage at the time, a guy called Steve Wynn, publicly speculated, again, this plays into the corporate spin, that somebody in the audience with a beehive hairdo had distracted Manticore. Yeah, I mean, that is not what happened. The cat attacked Roy. And I I don't know why they were so protective about that narrative. I know they were trying to protect their brand as, like, you know, a crucial Vegas double act. But, I mean, it was obvious they were never going to perform again. Roy had part of his brain cut away. He suffered a crushed windpipe. He was partially paralysed. It caused a mini stroke. Um, You know, for the rest of his life, he was frequently in and out of wheelchairs. But even though it was obvious that the tiger had attacked him, and I wonder if it's because it's 2003. You know, we're only two years after 9-11. There were still these weird conspiracy theories. There was, a, there was a police investigation as to whether it might have been an act of terrorism that mm. someone in the audience had purposely distracted the tiger to attack Roy. I wonder if that's all part of the spin that they were engaging in, though, because they were trying to make the case in the dying days of when it was acceptable to be working with animals in this way for the idea that this show should still be allowed, even though it was obviously involving uh, several parties that hadn't signed up to it, (laughs) you know, the, the wild animals. Firstly, Roy said that he was saving the audience from Monticot, that something had disturbed the tiger and he was going to attack the audience unless Roy was there. They backpedaled on that fairly quickly, and I think that's because if you follow that through to its logical conclusion, very litigious country, obviously, (laughs) that means they are acknowledging that everyone in the audience could have been mauled by a tiger at any point. So then they changed the story to, no, I was having a mini stroke and Montecor sensed that and dragged me to safety. And that is the story they stuck with extraordinarily for years Mm. and years. Even when Montecor died, uh, because they'd insisted that the animal wasn't put down for this, Roy wrote a tribute on Facebook saying, my lifesaver, Montecor, who was the one responsible for pulling me to safety where the paramedics could help me after my high blood pressure made me dizzy on stage. Yeah, it's so hard to disentangle the PR spin that they would have put to this from their own desire to believe that they were living in friendly relationships with these animals that they'd effectively enslaved. But Kay Rosier, who runs the Big Cat Encounter, which is a show near Sarasota, Florida, commented later, they're predators, so who can really know what goes on in their mind? Even 
even though they're raised in captivity and they love us, sometimes their natural instincts just take over. And it's really hard to see anything other than that as being the case. You know, this is a tiger. It's always going to have a level of danger. That's why the audiences are coming to see you in the first place. I mean, and that's what makes it all the more ironic that the success of Siegfried and Roy initially was due to the fact that they were seen as a wholesome yeah. act for Las Vegas. Going back to the origins of Las Vegas as a destination, it was all about, you know, topless dancers and gambling. It wasn't the sort of place you would take children or go with your family or even with your wife. It was mistresses or fellow yeah. lads only. So Siegfried and Roy was seen as something that was nicer, even though now I think we look at it and think, what an exploitative way of performing with animals. But at the time, they were seen as this shining example of the right kind of entertainment from more family-friendly Vegas. I mean, it's funny that that wholesome act was two children of Nazi soldiers from World War II who had come to the States. And admittedly, they were children during uh, the Second World War. Siegfried's dad was uh, a soldier who'd ended up as a POW in the Soviet Union. Roy's dad was also a Nazi, but he was killed in a bombardment and both found their callings at a very young age. So a family friend of the founder of the Bremen Zoo apparently gave Roy access to just sort of wander into the exotic animal cages from the age of 10, which is quite astonishing. Anyway, he left school at 13 and worked as a waiter on this cruise ship, the TS Bremen. Siegfried, meanwhile, had purchased a book about magic tricks as a child. He too ends up on this same ship, the T.S. Bremen, but working as a magician. And apparently the story of their meeting goes that Roy saw Siegfried performing magic and said, if you can make a rabbit and a dove disappear and reappear, can you do the same with a cheetah? Which, aside from being a really great pickup line, also <laughs> led the pair back to Roy's cabin to see this cheetah that he had smuggled aboard in a laundry sack called Chico. And the pair began from there crafting an act that centred on making exotic animals disappear. Here. I mean, at that point, just leaving the animal rights to one side, if you ran that cruise ship line and you knew that one of your staffers <laughs> had brought onto a cruise ship, I mean, there is no fire escape. You know, there's no evacuation route apart right. from into death in the icy water. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> had brought a cheetah on board to spice up the magic act with yeah, no that's... protective glass. And what happened is basically the, they did suddenly start pulling che the cheetah out of a hat rather than a rabbit and the cruise ship did think about firing them but the audience <laughs> loved it like right from the beginning they loved it and Siegfried and Roy performing together partly the fact that they were a couple I guess and partly the fact that you know you have a magician and an assistant so there's su suddenly a lot more that you can do but mm. really it's, and a cheetah <laughs> <laughs> really it's the animal isn't it and that's the thing yeah. you know there's the camp there's the glitz there's the glamour there's the fun there's the opulence there's the German accents there's the mullets there's the sparkles <laughs> <laughs> but without the animals, without the wild animals, they sort of didn't have an act. They're back to Siegfried pulling a rabbit out of a hat, which is boring mm. and even then was boring. And that's the problem, isn't it? They got themselves in a loop where they had to keep having more and more wild tigers on stage all the time. And just a word on how they got to Las Vegas. They ended up working on another cruise ship and there they caught the attention of a German nightclub owner. They then spent the 60s on the European nightclub circuit. And as would be the case throughout their career, Siegfried did the illusions and Roy did the animals. In 1966, they performed for Grace Kelly, who by this point was Princess of Monaco, at her annual Red Cross Gala. And that seems to be how they came to set up in Las Vegas in the late 60s where they would become associated with Mirage, which paid out, ultimately, $58 million for a permanent residency, which lasted from 1990 until the morning wow. incident on this day. Yeah, but that $58 million was just for the first five years of the contract. That's how big they were. I mean, it's, wow. you can't really overstate Ooh. how big they were. Michael Jackson wrote their theme song. They were the first ever full-length Las Vegas magic show, which I didn't realise. Like, magic has obviously always been part of Vegas, but even Siegfried and Roy, for the first 10 years, were part of a variety show. They were the first people ever, before Penn and & Teller and David Copperfield and whatever, to say, no, we're just going to do magic and you're going to pay $100 for a ticket to come and see that. So it was really influential. Mm. And the creatives that they had come over to work for them, because this was their second show, um, the one that Steve Wynn signed them up for at the Mirage, were serious level blue chip creatives. You know, they brought over people like John Caird who'd worked on Les Miserables in the West End. Like they weren't people that were from Vegas. They were people from the world of 
Broadway and the West End to make it the biggest spectacle they could. And obviously they also had to find ways to deliver a more and more opulent kind of experience. One of the things that I liked was how they had to dress up every single animal that they worked with as if it was the most dangerous thing on earth. So they were said to have staged these perfectly timed shows with elephants, lions, tigers and cheetahs, as well as sharp-beaked macaws. I'm like, that's just a bird, dude. (laughs) Tomorrow. But in its heyday, the train earned another nickname. It became known as the Spies Express. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, part of the ACAST Creator Network.